they uh, are dressed and the way that they act. Can I tell you that Christians are also distinguished by the way that they act and by the way that they live their lives and the methods that they conduct their business by. It's different from the rest of the world. And that's what I want to talk to you tonight is about one of those distinguishing characteristics that every Christian should have, and that's the issue of being bold and having boldness. And I've entitled this sermon, The New Era of Boldness. This was a message that I put together for uh, the Norwalk Church. I came and preached uh, there with Pastor Salazar uh, about two months ago, maybe now, on a Wednesday night. Had a really good time. Felt like I was back home again, you know, and uh, I wanted to uh, minister that to you this evening uh, out of this passage. Uh, Proverbs chapter 28 and verse number one, it says, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Pray with me here today. Father God, we just ask in the name of Jesus that you would have your way, Lord God, that you would touch lives here tonight. Minister with power and with dominion, Lord God. I pray that I would move out of the way and you would consume our hearts tonight. God, stir the flame of your holiness uh, within us. Uh, Give us passion uh, and desire for the things that you deem uh, important. Uh, And Lord, tonight I bind uh, the devil's strategy, the tactics uh, of this darkened world that tries to extinguish the light of God within us. Put a newness within each one of us, a freshness, a power that comes from above, Lord God. Uh, We give you all the praise, all the honor, and yes, the glory belongs to thee. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Every Christian, doesn't matter your nationality, doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter your longevity in Christ, uh, we all need boldness. Can everybody say boldness? That word means free and fearless confidence. That's what we're talking about as Christians, that we have a free and fearless confidence uh, in God, in God's word, and in God's work. We have to have that confidence that we are the salt of the earth, that we are the people of God. Not just because one church says they are, but because the word of God says that Christians uh, are the people of God, the work of God here on earth. Doesn't that turn you on just a little bit? It does to me. It makes me excited to be part of what God's doing. It's not always easy, but it's exciting. It means also that word boldness, to have a cheerful courage. Because you need courage to live for God. When you go to your place of employment or your school, sometimes even your own home, living for God is looked upon with negativity. It's frowned upon. Like, oh, there they go again, carrying their Bible. There they go again, praying. In America, if you're a Muslim, then you can go ahead and worship openly. It's no problem. But if you're a Christian and you worship openly, you're looked upon like, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? Uh, That's an antiquated and archaic uh, way of thinking. It takes cheerful courage to stand up to that and say, no, no, no. I worship the true God, the living God. I worship the God that changed my life. Isn't that wonderful tonight? Boldness tells the world that we've been with Jesus. The Bible says in the book of Acts, chapter 4, and verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled uh, that they and realized that they had been with Jesus. Man, this is one of the identifying factors of whether someone has been with Christ or not. You know, sometimes as Christians, we're a little afraid to... uh, kind of judge somebody's salvation, and and I get that. We are not the judge. God is the judge. Whether or not someone gets into the uh, gates of heaven is dependent upon God's word and what God says, and I realize that we don't get to say, okay, you get to go. Forget you, man. You ain't going. Get out of here. We don't get to do that. I realize that. But there are characteristics of people who've been with Jesus, the word says, and that is a boldness, that confidence we're talking about. When we lack confidence, when we lack a boldness, it shows that our relationship with Jesus is not as strong as the Word of God says it should be. 
that our confidence is waning because we haven't met with him in prayer. We haven't had a confrontation with his word. Reading his word and grasping his word and pondering his word and contemplating his word. Man, that brings a confidence that, hey, God's going to work it out. We don't just need a worship song to do that. Nothing wrong with worship at all. But we need the word that's going to do that. That's going to tell us that the things that we're singing really mean something. It's not just a good feeling, but it's the power of God to those who've been with Jesus. Boldness is also necessary to have when you're in the middle of conflict. Is anybody here in conflict tonight? Don't raise your hand, dude. You might all raise your hand. That's what worries us sometimes. Everybody's going through a battle. Everybody's going through something. Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 2. He says, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you uh, the gospel in, of God in much conflict. There is something about people who are going through conflict, but they're still confident that God's going to take care of business that God's going to help them through, that the Lord is going to help them in their marriage and with their family. I know it can get depressing sometimes. I realize it can get discouraging when your young ones seem to not want to follow the pathway that you know is the right way, and it can get you off your own track. But the reality is, if you have cheerful courage If you stand firm on the word of God and say, God, I believe you that all things work together for good, and I believe you that you're going to meet every one of my needs according to your riches and glory, that your plan is better than my plan, can I tell you that everything is going to be all right, and that's why we're bold and confident even in the midst of conflict. Sometimes we just need to get aggressive. The world gets aggressive about so many things. Have you seen the New Zealand uh, all-black rugby team? Man, they, they turn me on every time I see them. Man, they're like, Kamate, uh, Kamate, Koda, Koda. They got that face, you know. And I'm just looking at them going, yeah, that, that's intimidating just to watch them even on the television. Reality is they're confident that they're going to go and bloody some other team, you know. That they're going to take care of business. As Christians, we need to have that confidence. God's going to work it out. How he's going to work it out, how he's going to do it, what method is he going to use, well, we don't get to decide that. But is he going to do it? Amen. Amen. Done deal. Confidence in the Lord. It's a boldness that we have in him. People who have the great hope in Christ exhibit boldness. 2 Corinthians 3.12 says, Therefore, since we have such hope, the hope of salvation, the hope of deliverance, It says we use great boldness of speech. That means when you're in the middle of trial, you're not talking like, oh, it's hard again. How are you doing? Well, you're going to make it through. No, we're sitting here going, hey, circumstances are in a way irrelevant. I know that they feel relevant. (laughs) I know it feels like this is my world here. But the reality is, is we have hope that goes beyond what we can see. Confidence that it's going to get better. There's been times in my pastoring, pioneering churches, and the church I'm pastoring now and working with other guys that I know that it gets down and it gets discouraging and it looks like there's just a little bit of light flickering. But Jesus says that, that the wick of God, the little fire of God, he will not snuff out. The word of God says that. John the Baptist said that. And the reality is, is that you and I, can understand that we have great hope in God. And that's why we're bold. That's why we're confident to stand before our congregations, tell them, hey, you know what? God's going to build his church. That's why we're confident to counsel marriages and say, I know right now you want to gouge each other's eyes out. But tomorrow, it's going to be a brighter day. We have confidence in that. Can you say amen with me tonight? Praise God. Now, we do have a problem that, needs to be addressed, because I know there's people sitting here tonight that are saying, you know, I believe that, but I don't have it, or I don't feel that, or yeah, I know it in my mind, but it doesn't seem to be a reality 
down here uh, on earth, not a reality in my world. It's really nice when I'm at church, but when I get home, it's a different story. Uh, there, there's an issue that needs to be dealt with, and that's the issue of being cold, coldness. Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 12 says, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. The love of many. Isn't love the fire that keeps things going? Isn't love the motivational factor in homes and in families? Uh, every time I travel, I don't travel a lot, lot, but a couple times a year I travel. And Grace, when I get to my location, there's always somewhere in my bag a, a note from her. And that note is just always a day brightener. Uh, today, or well, not today, but when I got here uh, Thursday evening, uh, I unzipped my bag. She put it in my underwear area because she knew I'd look there first. Yeah, I know you didn't all, too, TMI, too much information, right? But I want to get a rise out of you. That's the most excitement I've heard from you tonight. <laughs> Maybe I'll come and show you my underwear. That'll get you going, man. We ain't doing that. Don't worry. Wait, they're streaming this. I will not show my underwear online. They're between me and my loved one. But she wrote this fantastic note, man, this fantastic letter, and showed her love and demonstrated her love. And that's what's kept us together for 30 years. That's what's kept passion in our home, in our family. That's what's helped us to overcome obstacles because of love. But in the world that we live in, because lawlessness is everywhere, sinfulness and strategies of darkness... It will cause many, not all, but many, love to grow cold, to grow cold, to get to the place where their hearts are no longer burning. And this is so prevalent in way too many people's lives. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, please. I want to show you uh, three very important verses here. Coldness and loss of boldness, because once you become cold, you no longer have that cheerful courage or that free and fearless confidence in God. And so what happens is that begins in your heart, in your heart. I know that that's not earth-shaking. I know you know that. But I think so often we just live our lives and forget about our hearts. We, we, we do what we do and we forget about the fact that our hearts are what matters. It's your heart that keeps you wanting to play the sport that you're playing. It's your heart that keeps you wanting to pursue the, 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 the field that you're in uh, academically or uh, e- even in your employment. And the reality is, is that we have to watch our heart. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, guard your heart because out of it flow the issues of life. Here we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, He writes these words, chapter 6, verse 11. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and open wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak to you as my children. Open your wide, open wide, your hearts also. He is talking here about opening themselves up, becoming vulnerable to the man of God, allowing their hearts to once again be open to the things that God wants to say to them. We can close our hearts sometimes without even knowing it. It was um, a couple of years ago probably now, my oldest, uh, no, my middle granddaughter, for her birthday, wanted to go to a theme park. We have one by our uh, area. Everybody knows Disneyland, but there's one called Knott's Berry Farm. And uh, she likes to go there. It's kind of an inexpensive version of Disneyland. And uh, there was uh, uh, some rides that she liked there. So I broke down. I cannot stand theme parks. Man. I, 
Uh, I'll sit and drink a soda, a Coke, you know, and watch them ride, ride. I don't care. But she's like, Papa, I want you to go on my birthday, take me to the theme park, and ride the rides with me. Okay, you know, I guess that's what you do when you're a grandpa. I don't know, but I'm, I'm doing it. So I get on this ride, and by the time I got done, I got off the ride, and I realized that my fists were clenched like this. <laughs> I didn't notice that while I was on the ride. It was like I got off, and before I did, I was like, oh, man, i got to play a coup here and open up my... <laughs> and, you know, I thought about that as I was writing this, that, you know, that's how our hearts get. They get closed, and we don't even realize they're closed. We become cold in our walk with God. We don't even realize it. It's like you're so cold, you don't even realize that you're cold until you get next to a, a, a heater, and then you're like, oh, wow, that is really hot. That is warm. That's wonderful. And that's what happens to our hearts sometimes. Our marriages, our feeling towards our family, kids for their parents, passion for the work. And this is what we have to look at. They were withholding their affection. The word in the King James is a word that we kind of, it's kind of a gross word to us, it's bowels. But that word literally means uh, the passionate emotions of a person. He's saying you're withholding your passionate emotions. This can happen to us. We stop uh, exercising boldness. And understand with me today, boldness is not a feeling. Boldness is an action. And that's why no matter what your personality is, you can be bold. You can be confident. You can be confident in the things of God. And don't try to hide behind the things saying, well, I'm quiet. Because that's what people do sometimes, too. They're actually, their hearts have become cold, and they say, well, I'm, just, I'm, I'm not as excitable as you. Well, I get that. But you can also say <laughs> that you're bold when you're not. And that's why you have to be very, very careful. The apostle is telling them here, start showing your passion. Stop withholding yours. Start showing desire. He's saying here, I'm a leader, and I'm showing you an open heart. Every person here who considers himself a leader, uh, an influencer of men or women or kids, can I tell you, you have a responsibility to open your heart wide to the things of God. It's up to you to have the boldness. You want your kids to be on fire for God? You be on fire for God. You can't just discipline them into being on fire. I've tried it. It doesn't work. <laughs> you, you, you have to demonstrate that. I was telling Pastor Mike that Tommy, our son, and his wife, Eileen, uh, uh, a couple years ago that at a uh, Father's Day service that we had, uh, I asked them to speak of what it was like to grow up in church. And they wrote this great thing. I, I really wish there was some way I could get them to do it in other churches because it was really uh, just, it was way better than I expected it to be. And they had six points. And, and they talked about different things about their growing up and their childhood. And they were, and once they started being very transparent, I started getting nervous I'm like, oh, no, man, they're going to tell how I really am, you know. But uh, Tommy said a very powerful thing. He says, you know, you, all your parents, you have to live what you live, uh, or what you live at church, you have to live at home. And, he, and then that's when I'm like, uh-oh. And he says, you know, what my dad lives at home and my mom is what, what they are at church is what they are at home. I'm like, oh, good. But, but my point in that, my point in that is that, it's important for us to live it out, to impart passion as leaders. So how do we do this? You know, someone asked me, uh, they, people ask me lots of questions that I don't have answers to sometimes. They ask me strange questions, how to do this and how to do that. And I'm like, wow, I've never even thought about that. Why are you thinking like that, you know? <laughs> but a good question to ask is, if I become cold, how can I re-become bold? How can I ignite the flame once again? It's like being married to someone for a long, long time, and how do you keep the romance in there? You know, what is it that you do? I don't have the, all the answers to this, but I can tell you that there are a couple of things, and it starts off with we have to stop being old. We have to get rid of oldness. Now, I'm not talking about just getting <laughs> old in age, you know. Sometimes I look at myself, a picture, someone will snap, I'll say, man, I do not feel like I look. I feel good. 
I look bad. Gracie, on the other hand, looks fantastic. I'm like, boy, it looks like she's walking with her grandfather now. You know, it's really sad, man. I, I'm glad she still likes me, you know, after all these years. But the, I'm not talking about that. The word old means this. It means something that's become obsolete. Something that has fallen into disuse or is out of date. And so what I'm talking about to become reacquainted with boldness means that we begin to start using the tools that we have in the word of God. I can't do it for you. I can't go, okay, sit down here, read your Bible. Let's read about love in 1 Corinthians 13, okay? You know, that's what you do to your kids, right? But I can't do that to you. You've got to want to do that. You've got to say, wait, that's enough. Enough is enough, man. I'm acting like an old Christian here. I'm acting like someone who has no value anymore. I don't have any fire. What happened to the the me that was once passionate about God? You should be questioning yourself like that and saying to yourself, look it, I've got to start reusing the tools that the word of God gives me to reignite. I'm going to pray with fire. And, And maybe you need to even update. You know, I don't pray the same as I did five years ago. It's a new world. I don't do the things that I used to do. I don't preach the same. Matter of fact, young people correct me when I preach badly now. I'm like, wow, what happened? I never remember that happening before. Now they're like, no, let me tell you. I had a 28-year-old guy come up to me and tell me, you know, Pastor, you'd be a better preacher if you'd do this, this, and that. Man, my ego was like just stomped on right there. And, and, and I wanted to say, who are you? But I listened to him. I listened to him, took to to heart some of the things that he was saying, and it brought me up to date a little bit. I'm still old, but up to date. And this is what God is looking for. And so there's two things that can help you to become new and fresh again. And one is found in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 13. It says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Everybody say really loud, armor. Armor. One more time. So we're taking up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. The word take up means to pick up in order to use it. Pick up in order to use it. It means I'm going to get this armor and not just go, oh, this is so wonderful. I remember a number of years ago... uh, Pastor Jonathan had taken me to that uh, armory in Leeds, I think it was. Was it in Leeds that we went to that armory? And they had all kinds of great things from the different uh, war eras, different uniforms, different uh, uh, artifacts from different wars. And it was really kind of cool, cool little museum to look at. They had some things. But the exciting thing was when they had uh, these knights that were in battle kind of doing some things outside that were actually useful, people that were actually doing something. And that's the difference. Are we just putting the armor on and living in a museum? Are we putting the armor on so we can go out to win somebody to Christ, to build up some families, uh, to encourage some people's lives? Because that's what it's talking about. Take up the whole armor so you can use it. You've got to get out and fight some battles. Fake armor never works. So you need armor. And number two you need is artillery. You need artillery. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 4 says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. I, I, I want to tell you, this is a personal belief here, but you, you ponder on this if you think I'm right. Is I believe that when people lose passion... I believe that when people have lost the boldness and and entered into coldness, I believe it's a stronghold is set up by the enemy. And the reason I believe that is because if it wasn't, then they would just kind of move in and out of that really quickly, like you go through a season of life, right? But that's not whatever I see happen. Once they get into that mode of cold living, passionless Christianity, they just remain there sometimes till the end. There's one particular 
woman that I know that was once a, a passionate part of our congregation, involved in some really exciting evangelistic ministry, uh, was always just had, like they say in Spanish, the piquete, had the fire, just wanted to go after it and do it. And now sits in the back of our church, just bored out of her mind. I can tell she's just totally losing. I, when I preach, I cannot look at her. I cannot look at her. Because I'll just look at her and go, forget it, man. Let's all go home, close it up, and let's head out. I ignore her, find one person that has passion, and go, that's what I want. Because I do have passion, but I, I believe it's a stronghold. I believe it's a stronghold. And so what we need is weapons from God in order to do that. Weapons that are not carnal. It's not going to just, let's take a holiday and we'll feel better. Because sometimes we think like that. I just need, I, I've got a guy right now who's telling me, I just need to get away, Pastor. I just need to get away. And sometimes we do need to get away. Sometimes we do need a holiday. But that's never going to make you bold for God. That's only going to give you a little refreshing that goes away until you need another holiday. And that's why we become holiday fanatics, which is a whole other sermon that I want to talk about. It's not even a sermon, is it? That's just a pet peeve that I got. That's all that is. All right. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse 7, I want you to listen to this verse. In truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left. I want you to just kind of grab the passion of that verse. If you're a right-handed person, you get a ball or a rock or a stick and you take that and you throw it, you're going to be pretty good at it. But if you're a left-handed person, you can't use the right. I'm left-handed and I can't throw very well with my right hand. But passioned Christians are picking them up with both hands. They're ready to rock. They're ready to take on some enemy. Yeah, there's opposition. But they're not going down. They're going to remain filled with weaponry that stands against the enemy, weapons uh, of righteousness, weapons of God. You remember when Jesus was tempted, Matthew chapter 4, you know and you remember that he used the word of God uh, to combat the temptations of the devil. I know you all remember that. But you, you notice that he just didn't use any old bit of the word of God. He used relevant bits to the temptation that was assaulting him. Whatever it is that's coming against you, you've got to get that weapon in your hand. If you're being tempted with lust or perversion, uh, you're going to have to get the weapon of purity and righteousness in your heart. If you're being tempted uh, with divorce uh, and separation uh, and splitting from your spouse, uh, you're going to have to get the weapon uh, of unity uh, inside of your life. Pray about that. Seek God. Desire to be unified. I could go on and on, but I think you get my point here. See, oftentimes, we just don't have the artillery. One more scripture that I'd like to share with you on this subject of artillery before we close. It's First Chronicles in the Old Testament, chapter 12, and verse 1 and 2. It says, Now these were the men who came to David at Ziklag while he was still a fugitive from Saul. First of all, I'd just like to point this out, that I like that David, the king, the man of God, was called a fugitive. I love that. You know why I love that? Because sometimes I view Christians, powerful Christians, as these holier-than-thou saints that have no stain on their reputation. He was a fugitive, man. He, he had all kinds of things running. He had people after him and attacked it, attacking him. It didn't even matter. Men of God are fugitives. Men of God are Rambos. Men of God uh, are saying, hey, you know what? I don't care what the world says about me. I'm going to maintain. You know, people are always telling me, you know what? You need this for your life. You're getting older. You need a retirement system. You need a retirement plan. I don't have a retirement plan. And I worry about that. Then I say, wait a minute. That's not what I'm thinking. That's not what I want to do. I want to do this. I want to ride this baby to the end. I want to be the Keith Richards of Jesus, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? 
The guy knocked his head out. He climbed a coconut tree when he was high and fell down, 70 years old. Didn't care, still rocking, man. Looks really old, but uh, uh, still doing it. And in my mind, that's what I want to be. So here we see, I don't want to be like him, high climbing coconut trees, but... It says, David was a fugitive from Saul, the son of Kish, and, there, and they were among the mighty men. I want you to see this. The New King James it calls them helpers in the war. People who are passionate for God are helpers in the war. And this is what we need. We don't need a lot of generals, but if you're called to be a general, then that's what you have to be. If you're called to work in this area, then that's what you need to be. We're helpers in the war. I like that you have focus going on here. That's helping in the war. I like that you have people that come before service and pray. That's helping in the war. I like that you have musicians that can lead us in worship. That's helpers in the war. It's good that you have your ID youth program. Those are helpers in the war. That's what we need to be. Are you a helper in the war? I'm kind of saying that with that L.A. swag, you know. Are you a helper in the war? Because if you're not, what y'all doing? Just living for yourself? Don't get mad right now. This is the truth. And then it goes on and describes the helpers in the war. Verse number two. Armed. Are you armed? Do you have, is there a reason? If I was the devil... Is there a reason I should fear you? Is there a reason I should fear you? There's a couple of guys in my church, they've been saved a long time, (laughs) but just the way they look and their reputation causes people who are unsaved that come and see them, look at them and they still fear them. I can see it in their eyes. They were part of the Mexican mafia and some other really radical things. I, I don't know why they're letting me pastor them, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful they're ushering. But are you armed? It says armed with bows. Again, using both right hand, the right hand and the left, hurling stones and shooting arrows with the bow. Tonight, if you're going to be passionate for God, there's going to, you, you can't be half-hearted in your boxing efforts. I don't know if I ever told you this story, but there was a time when, uh, uh, in, not where I'm living now, but where I lived prior to this, uh, and I hear this commotion out in the street. I look out the window and I see this uh, group of about 30 teenagers as they're coming home from school and they're yelling at each other and they form this big circle. And these two guys are going to box. They're going to they're gonna throw down right there in the middle of the street. Now you'd think as a pastor I'd be going, hey, stop, break it up. <laughs> no way, man. I'm looking going, wow, check that out. <laughs> And I'm watching these guys, man, and they get this big old stance, man. They're like this. You know, and they're, they're like, you know, bouncing, you know. They've got this little thing going on. They're cussing, using every foul cuss word they could use to each other. And this carries on for seconds and then into minutes. And I'm sitting there going, who are these punks? I wanted to go out there and hit the guy, man. <laughs> In my mind, I'm thinking... Come on. You know what ended up happening? Nothing. I was totally disappointed, man. <laughs> Completely bummed out. And I looked at that and, and it just kind of like, and I guess maybe that's why I watched it, or at least that's why I'm justifying in my mind why I watched it, was because I thought many Christians are very much like that. We talk a good game, you know. We use all those fancy words, but we're really never really kicking the devil's tail. We're never really making the impact that we want to make or we should want to make. The point is today, I hope you want to be bold for God. I hope you want to. It's not an emotion. You can be 105 years old and be bold. You can be 15 and be bold. It's about having cheerful courage. It's about having fearless and free confidence in God. Don't let the lawlessness of this age put a love freeze on your Christianity. Understand with me today, we need to be bold. Can you say amen?
Give the Lord a big hand clap today. Let's give him praise.